My name is Jacob, and uh, I will be presenting transactional analysis tonight. Um, but before I start with all this, um, I just wanted to say that I tend to sound very convincing when I speak, so I want you to be very critical of what I say. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and not only that, um, when I was at the Vipassana meditation, the teachers there told me something that I thought like, it was, it was very useful to me. Uh, and what they said was that, uh, they told a story about uh, a mother and a child in India. And uh, uh, the child got a dessert. It was some sort of rice pudding. And there was a little leaf in it because the traditional dessert is like that. And uh, the child refused to take the entire dessert because there was a leaf in it. And the mother said, well, just, just take the leaf out of the dessert and eat it. But no, the child didn't want any of it. Uh, and that is like... It's like the kind of same principle as you apply when you, when you hear someone talk like me and there is something that you don't agree with or just doesn't work for you, then that's fine. Just throw it out, but don't take away everything. Okay. So, uh, I will begin with uh, writing up because since the transactional analysis consists of three giant balls. Um, and we, this, is, this represents three different states that we communicate from. Uh, so the one at the top is called the parent. Parent, adult, child. Um, and I will begin focusing with the parent. So the parent's job, all of these have different tasks, so to say. So the parent's job is to take care of its surroundings. So whatever happens, outside of me. The parent takes care of it. The adult is more the rational one. So, the, so there you are when you're rationalizing, when you're intellectualizing. Well, in the child, you're in the feeling. So let's see what, uh, what's inside the parent. So the parent consists of, first of all, two different states within the parent. There is a controlling parent and there is the empathic uh, parent. So I will write it so like here, controlling and empathic. Uh, in, the empathic um, in the empathic parent, everything is fine. We are not trying to change anything. So we are just feeling in what's going on and uh, being totally unconditional with our surroundings. Uh, while the controlling parent is trying to make us do something, something different, something needs to, um, needs to adjust itself or whatever. Uh, so, in, within the controlling parent, we have two different states. We have the unconditional and the conditional one. Uh, so, the unconditional one, uh, that's basically when, uh, when we are trying to save someone's lives. So, to make this a little more practical, uh, these two, imagine that you are at a playground and you are the only adult there. And there are a bunch of children playing around you and someone is picking their nose like this and someone is crying and someone is laughing and er everything is just the way as it should be. And someone is coming up to you and like, oh, look what I found, a little stone. Uh, and, um, and you are just there sharing their experience and everyone is happy with that. But then suddenly one of the children runs off and is going toward a cliff. Uh, and, it's, uh, and if the child falls over, it will lead to a certain death. So you're like, no, stop, come back here right now. So that's when you go to the controlling parent. So that's the main difference between these two, is that there is some, pretty much something dangerous happening here, but here everything is safe. But the main difference between the conditional and unconditional in the parent is that the conditional one is the one where we play the game uh, of reward or punishment. So, this is, so the controlling one, we can say that you're in the controlling one when the situation is not, uh, is not uh, life-threatening anymore. M maybe it feels life-threatening, but it's not life-threatening anymore. Uh, and, but we still want to control something, we want to m uh, make something different. So that's when we go to the controlling parent, uh, the, controlling the controlling conditional parent. Uh, and Let's see. Yeah, so 
Um, so, the, so the conditional parent, the, so basically we, basically we could say something like this, because some people are just very neurotic and tend to, to fall into the controlling parent, even though everything is fine. Uh, so, so, so a way to filter um, a situation would be to ask yourself like two questions. So one of them is, is this dangerous right now? So imagine that like um, a kid is going to school with, uh, with uh, I don't know, the, the opposite sex's uh, clothes or whatever. And you're like, no, you can't go to school like that. Uh, and then you stop and like, okay, but is this dangerous now? No, it's not. Actually, I don't know what will happen when he goes to school. I mean, maybe he will get to, to be the most popular kid at school after this. I don't know. Um, another way is if we, if, we, uh, if we want to reward someone. Uh, yeah, so if we want to reward uh, a behavior, we are trying to manipulate someone into doing something over and over again. Um, because we, we like it, or um, I feel like I'm kind of losing, losing the track here. Um, hmm. Okay, I think it's better that you just fire off some questions and then I will continue. Okay. Is everyone behaving like a parent, adult, or child? Well, well, here's the thing. This model is like any model. It's flawed. But, but basically, yeah, I haven't, I haven't uh, figured out a single situation yet that in which you could not place someone. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as I see it, yes, but I know it's flawed because everything is. Um, yeah. Okay, um, so, uh, hmm. Can you explain the difference between the unconditional one and the conditional Yeah, sure. The unconditional one, that's the one where, where so a, a child is actually going to get killed or someone is going to get killed. I mean, it is life-threatening. Uh, so then you just step in, you take charge of the situation and you are like, no, stop back here or whatever, yeah. Uh, but if it's not life-threatening, but you just, maybe you think it is, and, uh, or maybe that you would just long-termly, you, uh, you want the child or the person to do something very specific. Uh, you, you go into this, playing this game of punishment and reward. Uh, so, uh, Generally, when, when we do that, we have lost, um, we have lost, um, what's it called? Um, we have lost faith in the other person, basically. We are trying to manipulate the other person into doing something specific, as a, a specific result. But in the, in the unconditional one, we are simply saving someone's lives, basically. We're using force, in the, but only when it's necessary. Uh, but, but let's say that someone is actually doing a self-destructive behavior. So someone is, is like hurting themselves or we, we just see some self-destructive behavior and we are like, what the fuck are you doing? Wake up. And uh, sometimes that's exactly what the person needs. It needs to be shaked up really, really badly. Uh, but I can guarantee you that if you, all, if you do this every time someone is coming to you with a problem, then they will not come to you uh, with their problems in the long run. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Okay, so, so, so the basic idea is like between the empath em empathic and the controlling, it's like the em empathic is just, it's not, it's not necessary to change anything. But in the controlling, it is necessary to change something. 
but it depends on if it's life-threatening or not. So the, first per, so the first question to ask yourself is, is this life-threatening right now? But then we come into a different debate where it's like, okay, so let's say that someone is eating a bunch of candy. Is that life-threatening right now or not? But we know that in the long term, it's not good for them. Okay. Uh, and so basically this is, uh, this is, the, and this, this, uh, uh, this makes us walk to the, to the second part of the second filtering question. And it's like, does the person understand the consequences or not? And the, the basic principle of this is like, okay, does the person in front of you understand that uh, eating one kilo of candy is not good for that person? And then you sit down and you explain the consequences. But the important thing here is not to, uh, not to have it as a goal that the other person should, uh, should understand your values of it. So let's say that y you value it very highly, uh, the consequences, you value the consequences very highly, uh, that eating like one kilo of candy uh, will make you really fat or whatever. You, you see it as a big problem. The other person does not see it as a, uh, as, as a big problem. But the other person might not be aware of uh, the candy destroying the teeth or whatever. So you explain the consequences. But you are not trying to make the other person value the consequences as highly as you do. That's the big, um, the big challenge here. So the first question you should ask yourself to not end up in this controlling uh, parent in uh, normal everyday situations is like, okay, is this dangerous right now? And second question, okay, does the person understand the consequences? But don't, uh, uh, and don't try to, uh, try to make the other person value the consequences as you do. That is totally irrelevant because the other person needs to have the free choice. And the free choice is, um, is basically that the other person understands the consequences and gets to choose. Because the second that we try and, um, and, and put a condition, so first, let's say uh, that I explain the consequences to, to a person here. So I, I explain the consequences and then I say, well, are you ready to change now? And the other person is like, uh, no, I'll keep, I'll keep doing uh, things the way I do. And I'm like, oh, you idiot. Why are you not changing? So, that's, uh, so then I go straight to the conditional controlling parent. The unconditional one would, or yeah, the unconditional one would have been something like, well, or rather the, empathetic, the em empathic one would have been like, okay, uh, yeah, you're free to do whatever you want. But now I've explained the consequences and it's fine that you don't value them as highly as I do. Uh, yeah. So any questions uh, with the parent one? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, um, if it passes judgment, if it says that, okay, is one thing better than the other? Uh, the easy answer is no, it does not. So uh, that one does not say which one is better because for some people it works. It works to be in the conditional one. It works to be in the, in the unconditional one. It works to be in the emp em empathic one. Uh, so I, I cannot give you a straight answer to that, but what I have personally observed is that the empathic one is kind of, kind of uh, creates a safe place. Since if you step into a room, and we will play with this later, if you step into a room and, and there is a person that actively wants to change you, that does not feel especially safe for anyone. Um, but if you step into a room where you are accepted just the way you are, then that kind of speaks for itself. Any more questions? Okay, uh, we'll take a quick break and then we will head into the adult. Uh, okay, <coughs> so let's head into the adult. So the old adult is pretty boring because the adult one is, doesn't have any minor ones. It's just one big ball, the biggest ball of them all. Uh, and in the adult one, we are intellectualizing everything. So this is the place where we are rational, effective, and just always speaking in 
from, let, let's see if I pronounce it correctly. Phenomen? Phenomen? Phenomenon? Phenomenon. Yes, phenomenon. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we are always speaking in phenomenons. Um, so it's like, let's say that me and a friend is like exploring, let's say, black holes. Like, okay, well, black holes. Or is it really a black hole? Or is it, what, what's this actually doing? Is it the light that circulates around it? And we are just exploring it together. That's, where, that's when we are in the adult one. Uh, and this is pretty much the one that you want to be in when you want to, uh, when, when we are discussing politics, for example. So, so this is like, it leaves feelings outside. But the negative aspect of the adult one is that we, can, uh, we cannot pr process our feelings in this state. So it's like, on one hand, we have, we have the positive aspects of the adult one. And it's like, okay, we intellectualize everything and we come up with a rational solution. And the negative side is like, okay, uh, let's say that we are afraid of our feelings. So we tend to end up in the adult one as a defensive mechanism. So that, that is like the, the danger with the adult one. It's like, okay, well, we never process our feelings or we process them very slowly or we have our unique way of processing them, but, but it's not as uh, effective as processing them in a child. Uh, yeah, that pretty much, I mean, this, this one is really short. So uh, do we have any questions on this one or else I will head into the child? Anything that's unclear? The adult one. Yeah. So, uh, to put it frankly, like the uh, uh, the parent is taking care of something outside. The adult one, it's then it's the words primarily. So the words that comes out, that's the important one. And then in the child, we have the feelings. So I'll hand it to the child now, if we don't have any questions on the adult. Anyone? No? Okay. Uh, so the child one is, is uh, very much more interesting uh, because here we have all our feelings. So there is actually three different types of the child. We have the free child. The free child is in autonomy. It's just doing whatever comes into mind. It's like happily playing or being very sad or whatever. Then we have the rebellious uh, child and the adapted child. So, uh, the difference between those two is that the free child is doing everything in autonomy, but the adapted child, and we can mainly speak about the adapted because the rebellious is the exact same thing, but it's just the, the other side of the very same coin. So the adaptive child is doing something because the other person tells, tells you to do it. So it does not do it because it wants to do it. It, tell, it does uh, whatever the other person says. So, it's, so this is pretty much the pleaser. So this, uh, the adaptive child tries to please everyone in its surroundings. And it doesn't even allow itself to be happy until everyone in the room is happy. So that is the last one that gets to be happy. That's the adaptive child. So to make it a little more concrete, let's say that a person is telling me, uh, Jacob, could you go and get, uh, get me a glass of water? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. And then I go and, and I, uh, I hand over the water. So the, the, I could have gotten the water out of two, two different states, basically. I could have done it from the free child or from the adaptive child. So the free child in me would have been like, oh yeah, I want to give this person water but the adaptive child is actually playing the very same game as the conditional parent. But, it's, but on the other way around, it's expecting it. So the conditional parent uh, puts the request, um, well, it's not a request, it's a demand, rather. So it, the conditional parent says something like, um, uh, yeah, if you, if you get me that glass of water, I will, give you, I will give you some money, some coin here. But if you don't, I will punish you. So that's the conditional parent, but the adaptive child is expecting this. So the adaptive child, uh, if I were, were, were to be an adaptive child and I would have gotten that person the water, then I would have expected a reward 
from the other person. Uh, so in, why, in one way of saying it, I would have felt like the other person would be in my debt. And then eventually I would have gotten really, uh, really pissed off at this person because I, um, I, wouldn't get, I, I never get the reward. I mean, where, where is the reward? So um, uh, another way of saying it is like, you know the feeling when you do something for someone else, uh, for someone else and the first time you do it, that person is like really shows uh, gratitude. And you're like, oh, wow, that gratitude, yes. And, and then you expect that gratitude again. Then you're in the adaptive child. But the free child does it and is happy, but it doesn't matter if the other person is happy or not. Uh, so to, uh, to, to break this down a little bit, uh, when we are in interactions with other people, we always give each other's feedback. Feedback in like uh, standing like this and analyze or being like, oh, yeah. And, uh, or, uh, well, that's just the body language. I mean, then it's the, the tone of the voice and then it's what we actually say. Something like, yeah, well, I really appreciated what you just did. Or, I, yeah, please don't do that again. Uh, or whatever, but it's, it's just feedback. So how do we know the difference between feedback? And, because feedback and basically playing the punishment reward game. Because it's the exact same thing, but the whole difference is that in the, uh, in the punishment reward game, we are trying to manipulate the situation. While in, in this other one, we are just giving unconscious feedback. Or well, rather that we give feedback and we don't expect anything to change. We are fine with things staying the way we are. Even though we, we may be, uh, maybe we are not fine with it, but we are not actively trying to change the other person. That's the whole idea. Um, so in the, in the adaptive child, and this is, this is uh, actually this is the one that, this is the reason why so many people in Sweden tends to, and as we say in Sweden, walk it to the wall, go in the vegan. Uh, the, so all of these people that, uh, that actually burns out uh, when they are working is in the adaptive child because they are doing the stuff all over again because they want to prove their worth. They want to be good. They want to uh, impress the boss or impress whatever because the, they, they feel like, well, I'm not worthy unless I, uh, what's it called? Can someone help me out with the word? Like... Um, what? Prove, prove yeah, pr prove yourself. So they are not worthy unless they prove themselves. But let's head into the second, uh, the, the exact same thing, but it's just the other way around. So the rebellious child is doing the exact opposite as the someone is, uh, as someone says. Uh, but it's not doing it because it actually doesn't want to do it. It only says no because the other person has said it. So it's not in contact with its own uh, needs and feelings and uh, its autonomy at all. Uh, and a pretty fun, funny example of this is that I was at a party like two or three years ago and I, I, I met a girl there and I realized that she was in the rebellious child. Um, so I, I explained the transactional analysis very quickly to her and then I, I, I said something like this. Okay, so I, I will show you that you're in the rebellious child. Say something that you want to do, anything. And she was like, yeah, um, I would like to go in to dance. Would you like to come with me? And then, and then I said like this, okay, I'm going in to dance. Come with me. And she's like, what? No, <laughs> I don't want to do that. And so she, she actually said no to exactly what she wanted to do, but only because I presented it. Uh, but because the rebellious child is like, and normally uh, the rebellious child has been the adaptive child, but wants to break loose. So it's the adaptive child that's like, oh, I can't take this anymore. Everyone, uh, everyone demanding so much of me and I'm always trying to please everyone, but I want to break free. I'm going to say no to everyone. And then they think that they are free, but they are not free at all. They are because, and here's, here's how you identify that you're in the rebellious child. 
When you have said no, are you happy with the no? So it's as simple as that. It's like uh, someone comes up to you and says something and you, uh, and you say no. But you are, you are feeling dissatisfied with your own no. That is when we are in the rebellious child. Uh, because if we were to be in the free child, we would be happy with our own no. We would be like, uh, no, I, I don't feel like that. But I mean, as you can imagine, the, the woman I met at the party was not happy with her no, because that was exactly what she wanted to do. Um, so that's, uh, that's the main uh, difference between these two. And do we have any questions? Yeah, so you could say that you're happy with the yes if you are in the free child. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so if, if we say yes, but we are not happy with our yes, or maybe we feel tricked, then we are most likely in the adaptive child. So we just said yes because the other person sa said so. Uh, and here is also something very interesting. It's like in the adaptive child, you could actually be in the adaptive child without being aware of it. But... Uh, but you can also be in the adaptive child and being aware of it. But in the rebellious child, you're always aware that you are in a rebellion or that you, uh, you are in this game, so to speak. So, so the, most normal, normal, um, the most normal reason for people to actually burn themselves out is that they are in the adaptive child, but they are not aware of it. So they are always trying to fix everything around them, but they are even not even aware of it. They are not even aware that there is something else or they are lost touch with their autonomy totally. Uh, yeah. So, do we have any fast questions, by the way? Yeah, so, so what if you tell someone a story from the past? That was, yeah. And uh, my spontaneous answer would be, well, you could actually tell a story from any one of these. So it, it, very, it, it doesn't really depend on what you say. It depends on what kind of energy you say it with. Um, so normally the communication between these tends to be something like this. So adult always speaks to adult. That's the main reason. Uh, so you might, you might notice that when you, when, you, uh, when you talk to certain people, you tend to intellectualize more with certain people, while with other people, you tend to be, feel free and feel maybe a little childish, and uh, you, you, are just, you just want to play, and the other person wants to play with you. And with some other people, you're discussing everything that's wrong with the world, or you are just agreeing. Uh, you're just agreeing, but you're, you're basically speaking about a third party and like how this should be, or maybe that you're, you're, both, uh, and you're both agreeing on like, uh, yeah, well, the world is a good place and you're both in them empathic uh, parents. But this and this is uh, just as often and this is the one that you will see a bit more frequently. This and this. Uh, so the parent tends to speak to the child. <coughs> and how that, uh, how that looks like <coughs> is basically, Let's say that, that I, I tell you that you cannot do this or can do this, or maybe I'm just there creating some kind of safe space for the other person. And the other person gets into the child. So to, to, put it, uh, to put it a little easier, I go into the caring mode and the other person can actually relax and, and go into the, uh, their feelings. So this is basically what, every, what therapy is like. So therapy is basically the empathic uh, parent, so, and the, the really good therapists, they, they create this safe space. And the person walks in and like, oh, finally, I can go into the child and I can process feelings. So this is, this is coming from, uh, from a view that is that we humans always have a static picture of everything. 
So when we walk into a room, we have these expectations of how everything will look like or how a person will, um, will act or whatever. We, have, we always have a static picture of the world. But the world is not static, it's always changing, it's always dynamic. So what happens is that whenever our worldview um, doesn't match our expectations, then our bodies are uh, producing, uh, it's called alstrar, how do you say it in English? Generates, yeah. So, so the body generates feelings. So feelings come up, come up. We, we, uh, perhaps we feel like overwhelmed, like, wow, this is much better than I expected. Or maybe it's like, oh, fuck, this, this is really the worst. So that's, that's when we process the feelings and then we, so we break down our old uh, world, world view and then we build up a static one again. And then it goes on and on and on and on like this. Uh, so this is, this is the basic principle. Um, and, thi and this is why so many people love therapy generally, because th that's a place where, where you feel safe to process the feelings. And then you are ready for a new world. Because what generally happens when we are afraid of processing, when we are afraid of our own feelings, then we put them, on a, we like put them somewhere the, where we don't want them to, we, we just don't want anything to do with them. Uh, so we walk around with a static picture of the world and we are trying to maintain it, but we are feeling like shit because we don't even dare to process our feelings. Uh, so I recommend to you all that you process your feelings. <laughs> um, yeah, so another way of uh, something else that this also could explain uh, let's see, yeah, uh, it's also a religion. So religions are, in the best case scenario, God is a parent. It's a, it's a parent and it's the empathic parent. So this is the best case scenario. God is always sharing your experience and you're like, oh, wow, nice. I always have someone that loves me. I feel safe. I can rest in whatever I want to with other people, uh, but I feel safe. Uh, and I feel I can be in the free child because the empathic uh, parent doesn't put any conditions on you and isn't trying to change anything. So this is the best case scenario is that you are in a community with everyone else because they also have the same parent as you do. So you walk around and like, oh, wow, this is, this is amazing. Uh, and the worst case scenario with the religions is that you, you feel that God is a conditional controlling parent. So uh, the conditional controlling parent telling you that, well, you cannot be like this, you have to be like this, blah, 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 and it's like, okay, but if you do this enough, then I will reward you with heaven. But, um, but if you don't do this, then you will go to hell. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and you respond like, okay, well, it's really important that I do this, but not because I am the free child, but because I mean the adaptive child. Uh, so this is the worst case scenario, and then this person goes around uh, in the conditional controlling parent to other people around them, and it's like, well, you should do this because you, uh, you will get rewarded by him if you do this enough times. What, what are you doing? Stop doing that. No, you can only have sex with one person in your life. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the worst case scenario. Uh, yeah. Any questions to that? Yeah, pro Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so what you said was uh, just so the microphone will get. Yeah. Um, so you said like so sometimes you feel like processing your feelings is the constructive way, and sometimes it's it's uh, it's fine to not process it. So, uh, what does it mean to process your feelings? Well, to process your feelings is basically to feel them. But is, this is not, this is like, it doesn't per definition gives you consequences if you don't process certain feelings because every feeling doesn't uh, per, per definition ends up um, 
breaking down something and then making something new. Uh, that was very bad explained. Okay, so um, so per definition, uh, feeling uh, putting your feelings in a hold does not per automatically generates a lot of badness, so to speak. But feeling the feelings will always result in change. So that's, that's, that's the basic principle of it. So processing your feelings is ju just means to feel the feelings, nothing else. Yeah. So another interesting aspect of this model is that it, it could also explain the communication we have to ourselves. Uh, so imagine that you're communicating with yourself and you might be saying to yourself something like, oh, uh, you have to do this or else you suck at life. Or maybe um, if you do this enough, then you will get a reward. So we speak to ourselves in the conditional controlling parent, or maybe we speak to ourselves in the empathic parent. So this is basically nonviolent communication. So they say something like, well, be in the uh, empathic parent to yourself and to everyone else. So they are, they, are really, they are really talking strongly from the empathic parent style. That whenever we feel, um, as they say, the jekyll in you, so uh, the jekyll is, um, uh, the jackal is, um, the, that is basically the conditional controlling parent to, talking to you, saying that you are worthless, saying that you suck, and then they just want to empathize with that part. So they are, they are speaking very heavily of, on the em empathizing part. Or maybe you are speaking to yourself in the adult way, something like, well, so let's, let's say, for example, that you walk into a room and everyone is treating you like shit. And you're sitting there, and you're you're, and a bunch of feelings comes up, but you you don't want to feel them right now, and you. You just you just uh, can't find the parent style in you. So you're going to the adult style, and you are trying to rationalize everything. And like, oh, why are they acting like they are? And this is like a kind of defensive mechanism. But then and then you might be saying like, oh well. Uh, they, they must be like this and this, and then you're trying to diagnose them. So that is basically the adult uh, in you speaking to yourself. Uh, so this, this model could be applied to your communication or to your relationship with yourself as well. Um, but something that's a bit more interesting, I would say, is that we also have a hidden communication when we speak to other persons. So this is... This is like where whenever we, we speak to someone, um, whenever we speak to someone, and it's, it's th this is the obvious one, this is the one that everyone can see, that, that is like the, the, the strongly marked arrows. And my teacher actually met two, two women that were the most successful salesmen she has ever met. And they had come up with a strategy which was basically that they were in the adult one and they were presenting the product, speaking in phenomenons, uh, so rationalizing just like, yeah, this is the product and this is what it does and it's, it vacuums the entire uh, blah, blah, and yeah, uh, just explaining the product. But there was a hidden communication in there as well. And that was basically the body language and or the voice of tone or every, every all of this. And the hidden communication is basically what we think about the other person. So if, we, if, if someone comes up to me and starts talking to me and I feel like this person is the worst, but I, um, I'm still like trying to hold up some kind of facade or something, uh, the other person will most likely notice this. But what they came up with was something like this. So this is the hidden communication. They spoke from the conditional controlling parent saying, you're not worthy to buy this, to buy this product. And their inner child, the rebellious child answered and it was like, no, you know what? I am worthy of buying your product. So most of these people bought their product. Uh, and, and then they felt tricked, obviously. And they were like, but what? I have been tricked. But then they, wa and they walked in, 
threw it in their head and was like, well, the women didn't say anything uh, weird at all. They just presented the product. But the body language and the voice of tone and every, uh, all of these aspects, all of these variables, communicated that the person was not worthy of buying the product. So this is the most successful sales technique that you can never use and you will be extremely successful and you will also ruin your life basically because then you will you will stay in that kind of uh, communication with everyone else in your life and everyone will go around and uh, try to rebel against you uh, with uh, yeah um, so it comes it comes with a cost um, let's see so this is the hidden communication Yeah, any questions to, to the hidden communication? How would you, how would you sell a vacuum cleaner <laughs> and your body language is not high enough that you're not willing to buy the vacuum cleaner? Yeah, so, so how, would you, how does it look like? Yeah. You're basically asking, how does it look like when you're presenting something from the adult to adult, but the hidden communication is uh, going from the conditional parent saying that the other person is not worthy enough? Well, here's the thing. You, you don't see it at all, basically. But the, the only thing that, uh, that that uh, salesman has to uh, tell him or herself is that this person is not worthy of buying the product and the rest will work itself out with like very, very small, um, small signals. But you can't really see it. N I mean, neither you, you don't see it and the other person doesn't see it. And that is why it's called the hidden communication. So it's not really graspable, it's just a communication that uh, both will uh, both will uh, will feel it basically. Uh, yeah, this is the second time I I got uh, another topic on my uh, just just at the tip of my tongue and then I lost it. So maybe it will come back after a few more questions. Uh, yeah, okay, I have it now. Okay, just so I I don't lose it. Uh, so there are so many books um, trying to sell in the concept of how you manipulate a conversation or how you manipulate other people in your surroundings to, into making them what you want them to do, right? So there are so many books on this topic, like become the master of conversations or, um, or like the whole pickup artists, like, oh, this is what you say and do to make women sleep with you. You just have to do this and, or do that. And all of this stuff is basically the conditional uh, controlling parent uh, trying to communicate with the adaptive child in the other person. Uh, but here is the thing. It might work out in, in the situation, in the specific situation at the time, yes. But long term, it sucks. And here is why. The, the, it will result in two, two different ways. When you, are, when you are manipulating another person, and you are making the other person do exactly what you want, then it will end in, in two different ways. And it's always a boom, boomerang effect, so to speak. Uh, so either the person will eventually you know, swap from the adaptive to rebellion child, and the person will have had enough of your bullshit. Uh, and, it will, and the person will say no to you on everything that you uh, say. So you will feel uh, dissatisfied having the no, and the person will feel dissatisfied saying the no. So everyone will be unhappy. But here is actually the, the worst part. And if it doesn't end up like this, it will end up in a much, much worse way. And it will be like eventually, if the person stays in the adaptive child, and y you just continue um, with your manipulation and doing and saying and making the other person do whatever you want, eventually you will go crazy because the other person is only doing it because you say it. So you will go crazy about the fact that the other person does not do this out of their free will. It will drive, it will drive everyone crazy. So imagine that the only reason why this person acts the way they do is because you tell them to. So yeah, that's, uh, this, is, this is the boomerang effect. This is why it doesn't work. So do we have any questions to, to that part? What about that? Yeah. You're saying like you're in the efficient mode. 
Yeah. Speaking from my shadow, I mean, is, is it then someone walking in shadow to do that, or can they be in shadow and then my communication is not really working because I'm an actor from the other side? Yeah, yeah, that was a great question. So, so, uh, could I, so your question was like, could an adult speak to the other person's adult, but, but the other person does not respond that way, and the communication doesn't work? Yes, it happens all the time. So the most normal one, where I would say, would be something like uh, someone else's parent speaks to the other person's child, but the other person responds from the adult to the adult, because that pers person, for example, doesn't feel safe with being in the child, for example. Or a child wants to play with another child, um, just normal play, and but the other person uh, does not want to play, but the other person wants to be in the parent. So the other person uh, starts communicating like this. Uh, so what happens when we, we don't respond the way that, uh, the, uh, that the other person is trying to communicate with us, then simply it doesn't work. But it will, it will sort itself out because we tend to want to communicate with other people. So when, when another person only speaks from the adult and I am, uh, I am uh, always speaking, let's say, uh, from the parent, then eventually one of us will, will cancel the other one out or the other person will start communicating um, so, uh, so our communication match. So that is, that is what happens. Uh, and I would say that is like um, most people that are new to therapy uh, comes in and are in the adults and trying to rationalize their own feelings and trying to explain like, yeah, well, I think this is why I'm feeling the way I do and blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then eventually, uh, and the therapist hopefully stays in the empathic parent all the time until the person unlocks the child in them. Or if, um, if um, yeah, or if, uh, if I am always communicating from my child to another person's child, I want to play. Um, and the other person is, all, is only speaking from the adult. But eventually that person sees that it's so much fun being with me that the person just falls right into the free child and like, yeah, let's do this. Uh, yeah, so, so it was a great question. We always want to, to match the other person in one way or another. But how that looks like it's, it depends on the persons, on the people. Yeah. Any more questions to this? Can someone get stuck in a certain position? Can someone get stuck in a certain position? Uh, I feel like I've met people who are always a little bit less than the student, but there's a therapist who is static. Therapy doesn't work. So they get through. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, can you get stuck in, in one of them? Uh, yeah, most certainly, yeah, most people are stuck in, in one of them. Um, and you could, you, you could actually, I mean, when you just go outside, you see that people are basically, we, we tend to have one favorite, but, it, but some, some people are more talented in, in walking between these, and some people are only, as you say, totally stuck in one. And that's fine. I mean, it is what it is. Um, but yeah. You can definitely get stuck in one. And for some people, for your whole life. I mean, there is nothing that says that we, per definition, explores every one of these in, in our lives. Because we could very much be stuck in one of them in our entire lives. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Uh, this is based on uh, some old man in the 1950s, uh, I, I clinical psychologist. I don't know what his name was, Bird or something like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, so there is like the transaction analysis is having this uh, this a, a certain basic worldview. So it's it kind of says like okay, we can we can either see humans as humans that, that wants to um, cooperate with others, that wants to uh, contribute to the society. 
or we could do uh, like most in society do, uh, most people in society do, and watch people like they are lazy and they don't want to do anything. If they get the free choice, they won't do anything. Um, so that's like a, a, a big stone in the transactional analysis. It's like knowing that people want to contribute. And that's actually, that's actually, that's actually pretty obvious because there is nothing that feels so good to us humans than the feeling of contributing to life or contributing to someone else. So that is, uh, I, I personally think that it's, it's, it speaks for itself. It's, it's so obvious that that is, that is the case. But, but a lot of people are, um, does not trust this and they have been raised in a way that is that society is basically telling them from the conditional controlling parent that, well, if you want to get anywhere in life or if you want blah, 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 uh, then you have to do this and this will be your reward or and this will be your punishment and you are not worthy enough. You always have to do more and blah, blah. Uh, and then we, we tend to fall into the adaptive child and everything will be mystery. Uh, but, but for some people it works. I mean, some people, uh, to, to put it more precise, some people doesn't feel the, 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 the bad effects or consequences of being the inadaptive or the rebellious child. And some people feel it very, very much, um, very overwhelming. So it depends from people to people. And some people, some people manage to be very productive in, in, an, in one of these states, in the conditional controlling parent or in rebellious child and whatever. I have seen so many Twitter accounts that are constantly in the rebellious uh, uh, child and have like one million followers. And um, so it works out for some people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the empathic uh, parents and the free child. So the so the difference here is that the empathic uh, parent is there to share your uh, to share your experience. Well, so what what um, what is primarily in the empathic uh, parent is that it wants to take care. So it creates a safe place, or it wants to take care of something. While the free child is the one that goes around and play. So that is that is the basic. Uh, uh, that is the difference between them. That is, in the free child, your feeling is primarily, and in empathic uh, parent, the caring part is the primal, uh, primal aspect of it. So he's always trying to take care of something. How would you say that you usually act? How I usually act? <sighs> yeah, I, I tend to vary from free child to conditional controlling parents, basically. I, whenever I notice myself be there, I try to go into, oh, well, it's, it varies from these two and, and the free child. Uh, I mean, I don't know, I, I, vary, I vary kind of often. Yeah, and sometimes I just like the idea of exploring something in uh, phenomenons. Yeah, I pronounced it correctly, yeah. So it depends on the situation, and uh, I can imagine that it's it's the same for you guys. I mean, we, yeah, we we have we have our favorite one, but we also have the ones that uh, belongs to different communities, um, different uh, groups of friends. So like for with some friends you tend to play a lot, and with some friends you tend to analyze a lot, and with some friends you just uh, take care of each other's basically. Was that kind of the answer? Yeah. Well, it seems so clear to me that you usually don't uh, say that how the person are technically in an empathic state, or that they usually are in one way. Well, if you know them. If I know them, yeah. If I know them, yeah. But if, if it's the first time I, I see someone, I mean, the, situ the situation. Um, I mean, the person could feel 
unsafe with me right now because it's a new uh, meeting and the person might fall into the uh, adult or perhaps in the controlling conditional one where it's where it feels ex extremely unsafe and wants to wants to manipulate me into something or whatever so it's it's kind of hard to put someone in a box the first meeting but it's but if you know someone then you are probably going to uh, at least tell uh, which one of these the person uh, the person's favorite will be when they are with you. So that's that's basically the only thing that you could say. But also, I I personally think that it's kind of obvious when when someone is in, in the rebellious child. That is the one that makes the most noises. Uh, the the adaptive child. I would say that it becomes pretty obvious when someone is in the adaptive child when the person is doesn't have the courage to say no. That is, that is uh, basically when I, when I know for sure that the person is in, in the adaptive child. And for obvious reasons, I personally feel like I cannot trust a person that is in the adaptive child because that person will only say yes to everything. And that person will never say no to, uh, to because it's too afraid. It's too afraid of consequences or it, it's, it wants the reward or whatever. But I mean, how can you trust someone that on, only says yes? But the person cannot cannot prove themselves. I mean, other people cannot prove themselves to you uh, by uh, by you going around like, well, you have to say no one time, and then I will trust uh, in your strength of saying no. Uh, because if the other person would say no one time, then you would still feel distrust towards that person. It's like, well, you only said no because I told you to say no. Uh, so it, so it, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, but, uh, but generally, generally that's, that's how I feel. When I notice that someone is in the adaptive child, I, uh, I either try to create a safe sp uh, space for that person uh, or I just walk away because I, um, uh, I, I feel too awkward. <laughs> that's, that's basically how I respond. Yeah. When you're analyzing your relationship to yourself, can you be in, diff in two different states at once? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the basic principle is like, okay, imagine that you are here and the person, there is another person speaking to you. That is your inner voice. So the inner voice is not you, it's just an inner voice. So that is b the basic principle. It's like the other person might, uh, might say something like, well, do this, do that. And you respond from a no, I won't do, I, I will not do that. So, so the answer to your question is like, you are always in one of them, but your inner voice could be some, someone else. So it, it's, it is, the inner voice is someone else. It's like a ghost or whatever. If that makes it easier to understand. <laughs> you are basically how you behave. Uh, I am basically how I behave. Uh, Who are you? You can be. <laughs> hmm. Um, well, well, that's, I mean, then we yeah then we would go into the uh, into the discussion of are you actually your thoughts yeah and the general um, uh, or well at least my answer to that is no uh, because you can always when you observe your uh, your thoughts then you realize that you are, you are not you are not your thoughts uh, how, but are you the way you behave I'm not quite sure I mean you are just awareness I guess and uh, the and the uh, and the awareness itself is basically in, in one of the states. But um, yeah, but I cannot, I cannot uh, answer your question any more than that. I'm not smart enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyone have any other questions? Otherwise we will begin with some exercises where we will actually, um, we will actually 
uh, play with these different ones. So uh, you get to get the feeling of what it means to be in these different ones and you hopefully can find your favorite as well. Yeah, so any last questions before we go into that? Everything is crystal clear to every everyone? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. It was always there. Yeah, exactly. It makes sense, very much sense. And the best part of it is that it's three. Yeah, yeah it's only three different things to, to have in mind. It's so easy. So don't you think that if there's anything else, it's always still a, it's, it's one of everything? I'm not sure because I have never, um, I've never found the missing part, I guess. If I would have found the missing part, then I promise you I would have presented it to you. No, but uh, I don't know. Uh, when Matilda was with Roy or Chris, I think, yeah. one thing that talked about is contextual change and false things. And you agreed more on that, but they're talking about some false things, some con the context of itself. Oh. You know, the question is what it means, but I saw it. Yeah, they have, they have a different uh, interpretation of this. I mean, there, there are like, there are like maybe three or four interpretations. Uh, different inter interpretations of this and it's like the more uh, the more academic version is basically like the adult is the one that has everything so th this is the one that you want to be in and because in the adult one you both have a uh, connection with the parent and a child so that is one uh, one version of this uh, and, and another and they basically speak of like these three are the ego states and but yeah, I, I personally don't know anything more than this. Yeah, this yeah. I, I saw that also, like, there's at least two different models. Yeah. Probably more. Yeah, yeah, there are, they are a lot of different uh, interpretations of this. Um, so what I am presenting to you right now is like, um, well, there, there is the academic one, and then there is the one that my teacher presents, and I'm presenting something in the, in the, in the middle. I'm like presenting to you kind of as we say in Sweden, lagom. <laughs> That's the, it's the perfect, perfect the balance of it, of it all. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh.